get started. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Andrea today. I think um, we're really kicking off the seminar series for the year with a real bang. We're very fortunate that Andrea's come here uh, all the way from, from Newcastle to give us this talk. I'll keep this really brief because I'm terrible at introductions. Andrea is very accomplished. She did a PhD at Macquarie University before a postdoc at McGill, uh, before receiving a prestigious fellowship at the University of Newcastle, where she was eventually appointed as a lecturer in School of Psychology, where she worked for a long time, which will make sense when you see Andrea's talk today, especially you know, uh, working in animal cognition and behaviour. And uh, she's moved across these days because of her strong conservation focus and um, where Andrea's you know, really important research makes a difference in, in conservation. She's moved across recently to the School of Environmental and Life Sciences. Um, I was very fortunate a few years ago when I was at Newcastle Uni, I guess slightly more than a few years ago now, to co-supervise an honours student with Andrea for a short amount of time as a very minor player. And I think it's safe to say I probably learnt um, as much, if not more, than the honours student. Uh, it was really great working in an avian um, model system, looking at exploratory behaviour in, in birds. And yeah, suffice to say, I learnt a lot from Andrea. But with that, I'll throw it over to Andrea. Um, and uh, thank you very much mm -hmm. for coming here today to give us the uh, first IAE seminar of 2022. Oh, I didn't realise it was the first one. So, oh gosh, <laughs> now the pressure's on. First impressions, always memory biases to remember the first of things. So, oops. <laughs> Look, thank you for the introduction, Simon. Thank you for um, the invitation to talk today. I have to say, I can't say how exciting it is to actually have got in a plane and flown somewhere to talk to people face to face after you know a couple of years of being locked in and doing Zoom. This is actually my first time out. So yeah, it's, it's nice to be here. Thank you, Simon, for organizing and the introduction, yeah. So look, I'm gonna to talk to you about behavior and cognition. I'd like to hopefully show you how people use behavior and cognition for applications in conservation and wildlife management, but also vice versa, how we can use species. Yeah, that I'm allowed to take it off. Oh, hey, that's better. <laughs> how also how we can use invasive species uh, to find and discover and explore cognition behavior. So it can go in both directions, in fact. Invasive species are useful systems to explore behavior and cognition. Um, so with that, first of all, you know, none of this work is done alone. I want to um, acknowledge all the people with whom I've worked over the year, many collaborators and senior scientists, uh, and including Simon, I've really enjoyed working with them. I learned so much from all the people I work with and then all my students who have come, joined the group and I've watched them fledge and come go away as doctors and uh, with PhDs. It's been a, a wonderful to see them grow through those journeys. So those are my acknowledgements to all these people and without them, I wouldn't be standing here today telling you about all these data, so. I'd like to start with something a little bit academic, which is a definition of cognition. Not everybody studies cognition, so it can remain a bit abstract but I would simply call it the mental mechanisms of behavior. In other words, what we're doing is we're studying how and what animals perceive in their environment and what they can learn about. And then we're trying to understand how they can use that information, environmental information to make decisions about how to behave, such as a dispersal decision, do I stay or do I go? And it's been fairly um, prevalent in the last sort of, I would say 15 years, to try and tap cognition behavior, but more specifically also cognition to, to address issues in, in wildlife management and conservation. This is an example of some wonderful work by Catherine Price and, and Peter Banks. They have used um, the capacity of rats to learn, they're a predator, to try and reduce predation on bird eggs. So what they essentially do is they'll take um, a space that they flood with um, the cues, feces and smell, so the olfactory cues of birds, and then uh, they'll leave that for a bit and then the birds will come in and nest. And what they've essentially shown is that the proportion of surviving uh, birds, nests, uh, eggs is higher in these areas that have been pre-exposed 
then in areas that are um, exposed concurrently with the eggs and the odors together. And essentially how this is working is that rats are coming, they're exploring this area because they're attracted to it from the olfactory cues, which are predictors of something to eat, but then there are no eggs. And so they habituate and they make the decision that this is not a profitable feeding patch, so then they don't come back and the eggs are protect protected in that way from predation. So it's essentially habituation, which is a learning mechanism. Now that's all good if you're uh, dealing with predators that use olfactory cues. It doesn't work quite, and you know where your birds are going to nest. Uh, it doesn't work quite so well if you're dealing, if you're a little endangered little tern and you have to deal with avian predators that are visual, they hunt by sight, of course. So we're attempting a similar sort of concept of using camouflage, but we are trying to determine whether we can improve the camouflage of little turn eggs against their background to protect them against predation by aerial predators, including gull-billed terns are a problem for little turn eggs, and the corvids are a, problem, are a problem for them. They take a lot of eggs. And so we're using um, visual analysis techniques that have been developed very recently to try and understand whether these eggs look, back, look camouflaged against the background. And what is important to realize is that birds don't see the world we do. They have a very different visual system. They see, uh, they also have, uh, they have different sets of cones to us. And so it's important to determine not only whether they look camouflaged, well, not whether they look camouflaged to us, it's whether they look camouflaged to the, to the visual hunting predator. So we model how these eggs look against their background through the visual systems of a gull-billed tern, essentially. And then we're trying to determine whether we can manipulate the background to increase the camouflage of, uh, of the eggs. And also, for example, whether quail eggs looks similar enough to, to little tern eggs such that we could um, bait this area. We could put empty quail eggs, for example, in this area. We could flood the area with quail eggs. They look sufficiently similar, but we've emptied them, so there's no reward. And the visual predators would hopefully hunt, often get no reward for it because they fall along an empty quail egg and they'll give up foraging in that ground. So those are the sorts of ideas we're exploring, but using the visual domain. This is something we've done trying to protect crops from pest birds. You know, pest birds eat a lot of the grapes and the vineyard, the winemakers get a lot of loss. They can use nets, but it's very expensive, very labor intensive. People also use scare, things that move, things that make sounds, but the pest birds habituate to them, so that's a problem. We've tried to develop, so this is work with the University of Sydney, all the engineers. Uh, we've developed a drone that flies over the um, birds, but we want to try and reduce habituation. So what we're trying to do is make this drone look like a predator and communicate a predation risk to the pest birds. And we hope that they will learn to see it as a predator. And it's based on decades uh, of work by others and myself showing that birds learn about predators when they see the alarm cues of conspecifics or heterospecifics coupled with the predator. So what we've essentially done is we've, we've attached a uh, dead body of a crow here to the drone and we also broadcast distress calls at the same time and we're hoping that the drone will then trigger learning in the prey birds They'll see it as a predator that exists within their community that presents some degree of predation risk, and that will reduce habituation. So far, the results are looking good. We can certainly scare birds away, but we need now long-term research to look at the long-term efficacy of this approach. And this is work I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, with the cane toad that's advancing. And this is the idea, this is the observation, basically, that you can train prey in advance of cane toads arriving because small cane toads, uh, when they're consumed by the predators, don't kill the predators. But what happens is the predators learn to avoid eating them through this mechanism called taste aversion learning, which has been studied within the animal learning literature for decades. So we know a lot about taste aversion learning. We can do it too. We taste aversion learn as well. <clears throat> and this has led to the idea of training animals, endangered species like northern quoll, they can be trained they can learn to avoid cane toads by being exposed to small ones, getting sick, and then they avoid pred predating on them after release. And also the idea of tossing out small cane toads in advance of the invasion wave so that predators taste aversion, learn, and avoid taking cane toads when the actual big individuals arrive that could kill them if they were eaten. <clears throat> 
So again, tapping learning to address a wildlife uh, issue. So I'm going to talk about the common miner today. So I want to just give a couple of little bit of a background. Common miners are uh, originally from Southeast Asia. They've been introduced to all continents. They've become successfully established, except in Antarctica. So they do very well. And they're one of only three avian species listed on this list. Uh, um, they were introduced to Australia, you probably uh, know, in the middle of the 19th century, and they've done very well. They've become very abundant in our cities in particular. So this has led to them being heavily trapped in some areas. AC ACT is one of the areas in which the common miners have been very heavily trapped. So we did some surveys and showed that about 80,000 birds had been removed over a period of a couple of few years. It's quite heavy trapping pressure, and we were interested in knowing whether birds common miners are actually um, adjusting to this trapping pressure. As you would predict, I mean, we're a predator, they're a prey, and they all have, they would normally respond, just like in a normal predator-prey arms race. So this is Marie de Calou's work. We took a look at the behavior of free-ranging birds in, area, uh, in areas where they're heavily trapped, both in ACT and Sydney, so it's a very large-scale study. And we compared the behavior of those birds with the behavior of birds uh, from populations where they're not trapped. And what Marie found was that they are adjusting, they're becoming, they show signs of becoming more wary in the areas where they're heavily trapped. So they hang out in smaller groups, they're more cryptic, and they're often, they're seen more often in vigilant behaviors. But there are, there are a few mechanisms that could be leading to this change, and one of them is learning. So I'd done lots of research by this time demonstrating that common miners are very, they can learn about new places, dangerous places, they can learn about novel predators, so they definitely have a good capacity to learn. And so we decided to test whether they could be acquiring trap avoidance learning in the field. So we set up an experiment where Marie went out and, and fed common miners in uh, free ranging common miners, she attracted them to feeding spots. And what she did is she alternated a costume on alternate days and then on for a bit of six days. And then what she did was what we call a simulated capture event. So there are common miners here inside a trap. A trap. Um, they're of course not very happy to be in that trap. And, and Murray is mimicking a capture. So she's looking, making it look as if she's trying to get them out, which is something that would occur normally around traps. And we're also broadcasting alarm calls. Uh, while this is happening. And what we're testing is whether this, these individuals that are looking, that are expecting to be fed, and all of a sudden they see this simulated capture, whether they're gonna learn something from this. We give them that one demonstration and then Marie comes back alternating between the two costumes and alternate days. And what we find is that birds, this is the latency to land at the site before the training um, time. And you can see they land fairly quickly and after the training, uh, after the simulated capture, they learn, they land more slowly and they land, they take longer to land at the foraging site and they land in smaller numbers. But what the, what the two costumes allowed us to do was to test whether they actually recognize the person who trapped. So at half the sites, the simulated capture was done with one costume and half, the other half of the sites, the simulated capture was done wearing the other costume. And in fact, what you see here is that the birds increase the number of alarm calls they give to the person who is now feeding them if they were wearing the costume that the person was wearing during the simulated capture. And they don't um, alarm call to the person that was not seen during the capture. So they know exactly the appearance of the person who was actually around the trap. So they clearly can learn trap avoidance and the people involved in these events as, as free ranging birds and they can potentially socially transmit to others. That's a possible mechanism. We've also looked at the possibility that we're removing trap friendly individuals and we're leaving behind genetically uh, more less wary individuals. We're removing the less wary ones and leaving the wary, wary ones behind. Uh, which is selective removal essentially, and we don't find any evidence for that at this point. So we're in, we think that this is a learning driven mechanism of behavioral change, which means that it could spread fairly quickly and we could end up with trap shy populations. So what I'm gonna focus on today now is to show you a, a range of behavioral experiments that 
in which we asked why a common miner is so successful. And they're one of the only three species that become uh, so successful around the planet when they're introduced. And then also, what are the drivers of the range expansion? Because this species continues to range expand across um, Australia. So I'm sure this is all very familiar to you. Uh, so I'll quickly gloss over this. You know, there's an invasion paradox, invasive species that have no co-evolution in a particular region, but they're introduced and some of them go on to thrive. And people have examined the predictors of invasion success. So introduction effort is one that is um, clearly important. How many individuals are released predicts whether they'll become successful. Life history parameters are involved. And people have also looked more recently at the effects of behavior and personality. And one idea is that species that are in these alien species might either outcompete, so they're aggressive, they're released, they're aggressive, they displace the native communities from the niche, they make room for themselves, or vice versa, potentially they're occupying an empty niche, so they're opportunistic, and they're using things like behavioral flexibility and brain size, and that's what allows them to become successful. So, what's the common minor story? Well, in the common minor story, you know, certainly at the time where we began this work, there was a lot of push uh, for common miners being very, very aggressive, particularly to because they're secondary cavity nesting birds, particularly aggressive to other and posing a threat to other secondary our native secondary cavity nesters. Now, you don't really need uh, to go very far to realize that common miners are very, very flexible in their behavior. Um, these are just some internet pictures that I pulled down. So you can see here's a common miner foraging on the sand. They'll pick up mollusks and, uh, and crustaceans from in the sand. We see them foraging on the edges of lakes, for example. They can forage in termite mounds. They can take insects off the backs of uh, animals in agricultural land. Uh, they can forage on fruit and flowers when they need to. Um, this is a satellite tower. Who needs a tree to roost in if you can just use a satellite tower? This is a lamp pole. We often see common miners nesting in lamp poles in, in Newcastle. Who needs a tree or a hollow when there's so many lamp poles? And then, you know, this is a photo I took in Fiji. This bird here was sitting on the nozzle of the plane, presumably pulling insects off. The very commensal. I mean, these are obviously very disturbing stimuli, and yet they're there right beside these big planes. And they're also commensal, you know, here's a bird being, you know, bird beside somebody's computer, they can learn to talk if you catch them when they're young, you can teach them to talk. And here's it's just getting fed from water. So, you know, they're pretty good at training us as well when it comes to it. So very flexible. They're very successful. Some early counts that we did show that in the areas where we worked, uh, they're six times more numerous than the most abundant native species in urban areas. So they do very, very well. And there was this controversy around this push for competition and being aggressive versus the idea that they're actually opportunistic. So for some very early experiments we did was to look at, to look for evidence for ag aggression in the species. And this is um, aggression around food. So you could attract them to food patches and you can look at the number of aggressive interactions. And in blue here, you can see the number of times the, the common miners are actually attacked. And you can see that versus in red, the number of times they attack. So they, they are the recipients of aggression in blue much more frequently than they are the donors of aggression. So they're definitely not expressing aggression. They're actually being aggressed in these packs uh, around food. When you look at the time they spent in the center of the food patch as a measure of dominance, um, you find the large species, the ravens, lorikeets, they're at the center of the food patches, the common miners are never at the center, so they're hanging around the periphery. Again, indication they're not dominant in these um, food patches. When you look at what they're feeding on, um, in black here, when they're feeding on artificial foods, that tends to be what they're eating. They're eating anthropogenic foods rather than natural foods. So again, pointing to them possibly occupying a niche that other natives, that native species are not occupying. So we thought, okay, we need to go to the nests and see whether we can find aggression. So as part of an ARC discovery grant, we had about 250 nest boxes deployed across uh, New South Wales and Queensland. And that's another story that I could tell. 
But we took this opportunity to do the typical uh, aggression experiment that you do in birds, which is you present intruder uh, mounts of intruder con specifics and heterospecifics specifics underneath the nest box. And you look at whether the nest box holder will attack uh, the mount, and that's your measure of aggression. And long story short, we found very little evidence that the miners are aggressive. What actually happened is that on the whole, most aggressive, most box holders will pay little attention to this intruder, very low levels of aggression. But when a bird does attack, they attack it very, very aggressively. So it seems like there are there is a small proportion of individuals within the population that can be highly aggressive, but on average, these birds, and I'll say in New South Wales, and you'll understand in a minute why, these birds are on average not that aggressive around, at least around nest boxes, um, but within the reproductive context. So we thought, well, you know, are these, are these birds occupying a niche that natives don't occupy because they're behaviorally flexible? And behaviorally, uh, so we can measure their behavioral flexibility. And in fact, behavioral flexibility is just what behavioral ecologists call cognition, to be honest. So one way of measuring behavioral flexibility, variation in behavioral flexibility or cognition um, across species and within species is to use um, these puzzle boxes. So we call them innovative foraging tasks that you might have um, seen in the literature. But essentially, there's a, there's a big literature, I won't tell you about it today, but there's evidence to suggest that latencies and performance on these tasks is, ref, is indicative of interspecies and intraspecies variation in cognitive ability. So uh, Marie de Calou presented, um, she did this study in the field, um, set up. So she presents all these species with this task. These are three Petri dishes. The middle one is open, so the birds can access food in it, and there are a mix of foods in there. And then the two lateral ones have a lid on top of them, and they have to be open to access the food. And the birds can access the tart. They can, they can get this lid off using a variety of motor techniques. So they can, they can lift it. They can turn their head upside down and leverage it. They can pull that little label on the side and flick it off. Or they can pick it up with their beak and they lift it. And some birds show lots of these motor techniques. And we can model the latency to solve this task as a function of a variety of predictors that you've got down here. I won't go into detail. Um, but what we essentially find is if you model the latency, then the question is, who is the fastest? Which of these species is the fastest to solve these tasks? And I, I can tell you the two extremes right away. I'm sorry, this thing keeps on popping up at the top. Um, but the magpie larks and the crested pigeons essentially never solve these tasks, so they never manage to open the um, task, whereas the Australian raven really clearly stands out at the other end, and if I've got time right at the end, I'll show you a couple of videos. Um, they solve these tasks very, very quickly. Basically, they walk up, they have a look, and they pop the lid off. Where does the common miner sit? Well, you can see that it sits here along with the Australian magpie, and the magpie is actually, uh, you know, a distant corvid member. And, and the common miner is sitting there at that level. Not quite as good as the Australian raven, but it um, outperforms the native species on these tasks. Now, um, another, we tried to understand what are the predictors of performance here? And the, actually the main predictor is um, motor flexibility. What do we call motor flexibility? We call it not only the number of different techniques the, the animals are using to solve, but also, the extent to which they are expressed with even frequency. So we actually use the Shannon index, for those of you who are familiar with that. So here are these donuts to it showing you expressing, sort of showing this idea. Look at the crested pigeons. This number in the middle here is the number of big task contacts that Paul Murray had to solve from, uh, had to count from video. So the crested pigeons are doing 2,200 big task contacts. So basically they're doing this but they never do anything else. That's all they do. So incredible persistence, but no motor variability. Whereas you can see here, the Australian raven has this more or less evenly expressed motor action. So they can switch motor actions when things don't work. And you can see the common miner here, and we've done captive tests to, to, to confirm this as well. They show a higher degree of flexi motor flexibility. Whereas the problem with the other birds is they're just not changing their motor actions, either because they don't or they can't. 
So, you know, to wrap up um, the story, we think that the common miner is so successful because it's, it's occupying, it's opportunistic occupancy of an empty niche. An empty, I don't see there are, say there are and no native species that occupy it, but certainly native species have a tendency not to occupy that, that urban niche. And we think it's underpinned by the capacity to learn and their capacity for innovative foraging, which is underpinned by this, uh, this enhanced motor flexibility. And we think the motor flexibility goes hand in hand with the evolution of cognition. So this is just a small digression to say that the story is never so straightforward. And that's also what makes it interesting to me is when this is work by Andrew up in Queensland around our nest box work. But he actually measured aggression around tree hollows in Queensland common miners. And this is an aggression network. So you can basically see all the species here. These are the non-native species and the species that are not local to the area. That's why the long billed corella here is in orange. And these are the number of aggressive interactions. And you can see that around natural tree hollows, the common miner is actually very, very aggressive around the tree hollows, along with the rainbow lorik along with the lorikeets, essentially. In fact, in these data, the common miner is the second most aggressive after the noisy miner. So whether this is because we're looking at tree hollows and we need to look at tree hollows in New South Wales, or because the Queensland birds are from a separate introduction, so there are founder effects that have led to a more aggressive, you know, higher levels of aggression in Queensland birds, either of those are a possibility, or that we've had, actation, we've had act, adaptation in the New South Wales birds, where there's been more clearing, there's less natural habitat, fewer tree hollows. And so we've led to a less aggressive population or outstanding questions, but they certainly point to this great opportunity in common miners to look at the effects of different uh, introductions to different environments. We know that genetically the Queensland birds are separate from the Sydney birds. They are actually different introduction events back in the 1900s. So, Having sort of explored why the common miner might be so successful, we turned our attention to, you know, what might be the drivers of the range expansion since the species continues to, to expand across Australia. One of the things that we became interested in was the capacity of common miners and their willingness to eat novel foods. Because when you arrive in a novel environment, not only do you have to, you know, not only exposed to novel foods, it's really important you eat because you're probably dead very quickly if you don't eat novel foods. Um, you also need the capacity to detect nutrients in those foods because you need to, uh, you need to cover your nutrient needs. And the, the experiment, the beautiful experiment that got us started on this was by um, Gabriel Machowski kapuska He did this great experiment in the field where he presented free-ranging common miners with a choice of foods, either high in lipids, high in carbohydrates, or high in... Um, protein. And what he showed was that the urban common miners preferentially choose protein. And not only do they choose protein when they're given the choice, they also fight over protein. And that's sort of indicative of the possibility that protein is actually a limited nutrient in these urban common miners. And that's what got us started down this track of becoming interested in, in the nutrient, the capacity of common miners to to use novel foods and to detect nutrients within them. So we started working with Gabriel and we set up some nutrient choice experiments. So this is work um, by Chloe Pinot. The first experiment we did was we put common miners in cages and we gave them, so we sort of did the same thing as Gabriel, but in, in the lab. And we gave them a choice of three foods, two of which were novel, and one of which was the food they'd been receiving since they'd been captured and held in captivity, which is dog pellets. And in fact, what happened in the first experiment is they preferentially ate the two novel foods. They didn't select the food they were familiar with, they chose the two novel foods. But those two novel foods were actually both higher in protein than dog pellets. So the question is, are they selecting it because it's novel or are they selecting it because it's got protein? and they have a capacity to detect this protein in these novel foods. So we ran a second experiment in which they were given the choice between the high lipid, high carbohydrate, and high protein foods that they'd received in the field in Gabriel's experiment. And they select, they're all unfamiliar, and, and here they select the protein-based food. 
So they like unfamiliar foods and they go for the protein in these, in these choices. Now, pro protein, of course, is important. It's important for reproduction. It's important for growth. Um, so that's, that probably explains why common miners in, in urban areas are fighting uh, for protein. What we also did was we were interested in linking behavior to nutrient choice. So we ran some, this is called an exploration task. Some of you might be familiar with this. You release birds into an unfamiliar room. It's got perches in it. You take measure, various measures of exploration, the extent to which they move around the room, how many perches they move to, et cetera. And we looked at the relationship between um, the amount of um, protein selected on the x-axis and their exploration tendencies. And what you see is that the more exploratory birds are the ones that choose, that select when given the choice protein preferentially. So we have protein seeking exploratory birds essentially. And this variation in exploration got us thinking about whether these exploratory birds that like protein are the ones that are on the invasion front. Now, why did we think of exploration being linked to invasion range expansion? It's because of the spatial sorting model, of course, that you're probably familiar with, but in a nutshell, what this model proposes is that individuals um, vary in some trait that's related to movement. So it might be a morphological trait, they've got longer legs or they've got longer wings or a behavioral trait that's movement related, such as exploration of the environment. And as a result of this individual variation, they move further across the, across the landscape when they disperse. And then individuals with this emphasized trait end up on the front of the invasion. They reproduce amongst themselves, which, which accelerates the evolution of these movement related traits. And you end up with a, 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 an increasingly accelerating wave. So we thought that's why, you know, this trait could be actually um, more emphasized, more present, they could be more exploratory birds on the invasion front, because the more exploratory ones are moving away from the established core. So what we did is we went and studied populations on the invasion front and compared them with the behavior of the, the exploration behavior of birds at the core. So Newcastle, it's the Sydney range, it's the Sydney invasion basically, um, the really established, old established core is in Sydney, but Newcastle has been established since back for breeding has been there for about 60, 70 years. And now the birds are moving westward as these colors go towards the red. This is where the birds are moving. So you can sample birds. We chose, the, well, we chose areas where they've only been, breeding has only been established for within the last 10 years at the time we conducted this study, that is. And we compared them to populations where breeding has been established for more than 40. Uh, we studied the um, behavior of free ranging birds in this study, and this is work by Josephine Burstall, and, and that's the work that Simon was mentioning before in his introduction. We put radio tracking tags on the birds, and we measured, uh, you know, took a variety of movement measures and compared their co core home range size and their exploratory home range sizes. And what you find is that the source, if you look, males and females don't differ in their whole home. Uh, their core home range size, but on the front, males have a larger core home range. When you look at exploratory home range, and that encompasses the occasional long distance journey, then you do in fact find that front birds have a larger exploratory home range, the birds of the source, which was consistent with what we thought might be occurring. So what's, the pro what's happening with the core home range size? We think that what might be happening is in these you know, more densely occupied urban cores. What's happening is the females and males are, are um, pairing up. They're occupying a territory together. Whereas possibly on the front, we have an excess of females and the males may be occupying, um, you know, wandering around several females. So there might be a slight difference in social organization due to the excess females with a dispersing sex. And that might explain this core home range. That's our working hypothesis. But the exploratory home range is certainly in line with what we thought we might find. So the question is, these are free ranging birds, right? So there's nothing to say that greater exploration of these birds is actually an inherent feature of the birds. It could just be that they live in an environment that requires them to make you know, longer journeys at times. So the way to crack this is to bring capture birds from front and source and bring them into captivity 
and test them under standardized conditions. So that's what we did. We were set up to do this. It was the next logical step. And when you measure exploration in captivity under standardized conditions, we don't find a difference. So front burns are not more exploratory, suggesting that what we see in the field is because they're free ranging birds and they're dealing with a different uh, environment. So at this point in time, we don't think that exploration is a movement related attribute that's driving the range expansion and a spatial sorting uh, model of range expansion in this species. But interestingly, every experiment throws up more questions than it addresses, more questions than answers. So this is what happened. We found that birds are actually more neophobic on the front. And in fact, so this so neophobia, you can measure it, you can put down, you can put a bird in a cage, you give it a food dish, you measure its latency to approach, you repeat that, but this time you put a novel object next to it, and the bird will take longer to come and feed. And it's that delay that we call neophobia. And it's a risk assessment of novelty. It's a measure of risk taking. And what we find here is if you compare the no novel object latency to the object latency, the birds at the front are much more affected by, by novelty than the birds at the source. In actual fact, this is exactly what we find in urban and suburban birds. Suburban birds are much more neophobic than urban birds. We showed it back in 2012 with Danny Sol. We'd shown that suburban birds here in this dotted line take a lot longer to approach a novel object than urban birds. So it seems as if our front birds actually look like our suburban, suburban birds in terms of their risk taking. So we thought, can we link behavior back to nutrient selection? So we because we're interested in this idea of protein being limited in these urban areas. And we went back to our nutrition choice experiment. And there, what we had found, we hadn't measured neophobia, but we had measured innovation and how it relates. So innovative foraging of the kind that I've just explained to you with the foraging tasks. And what we found is that more innovative tasks and more innovative birds are um, actually select carbohydrate. And we know that more innovative birds, ones that solve this foraging task quickly, they are actually less neophobic. We know that from other effects. So what we have is a high risk taking bird that's more, more apt at innovative foraging prefers carbohydrate, and it links back nicely to the slide that I showed you initially, that in the urban areas they're eating carbohydrate, they're eating artificial uh, foods, anthropogenic foods. So it's possible that these urban birds are eating a lot of anthropogenic foods that are high in carbohydrates, which would be, would be consistent with some of the patterns we're seeing in the literature. The birds that don't like carbohydrates are actually the less innovative ones and the more neophobic ones. So they're comparable again to our suburban birds that are not eating carbohydrates. So we are thinking at this point in time that what we have is an urban core in the source. These are risk-taking birds. So they're urban adapted birds, they're risk-taking, they score low, low on, uh, on their phobia. They forage innovatively and they eat carbohydrate. Um, and positive females, because they're the disturbing sex, they're leaving to either go to the suburban perimeter of town of, of cities, or they're going to the suburban front. But the question is, why are they leaving? What's driving them to leave the urban core? So we came to Schockart's model, credit model of urban birds. So what does Schockart propose? He's tried to explain why birds can reach such densities in urban cities. So I don't know whether you've read that literature, but birds can actually reach densities 40 times the level of, of the densities they can reach in natural habitat which is quite extraordinary. So why are cities supporting this low diversity but incredible abundance of some of these species? And he suggested that what happens in cities is that food is predictable, because there's always humans chucking something out, stuff in gardens, et cetera. Food is predictable. And although they can't, there are a lot of predators because there are dogs and things and cats around, predation rates are actually low. And I know that's controversial, but that's what he suggests in model, his model. Predation rate is fairly low certainly lower than natural environments and foods are predictable. And what this allows populations to be is that a lot of birds that would normally die because they can't find food or they're knocked off by a predator, they manage to survive. So what you end up with in cities is very high number of individuals, but they're in poor condition because they, you know, they're, feeling, they're feeding off um, rubbish food and they're in excess high densities, they can't get good quality food. 
Whereas in the natural environments, you have far fewer birds, but they have a much higher fitness. They're in better, better body condition. So this led us to think, okay, well, what about our urban birds? What kind of condition are they in? According to this model, they should be in pretty bad condition if density is a problem for them. And what we showed, we needed a measure of body condition. And what we showed is that if you nutrient deprive common miners, we can take them out into captivity, we can feed them dog, feed them dog pellets, which is actually what a lot of people feed dog miners, but it's actually, we know now, nutrient deprived. And what happens is their eye patch, which is here, you can see beautiful and yellow and orange when it comes in, looking at a suburban bird, and it fades to this yellow when they're nutrient deprived. So it goes very, very pale. So we linked changes in color of the eye patch to nutrient deprivation. Chloe then went across and collected, you know, about 200 miners from a variety of uh, sites across um, Newcastle, across the New, New South Wales. And they vary in urban cover as determined by the NDVI index. And see, she looked at a number of um, body condition variables. So here, I just want you to look at the green line because this is the eye patch, which we know res responds dynamically to these deprivations in nutrients. And this is a measure of body condition here on the right. So body condition is basically how fat you are relative to your skeletal size, and it's generally used as a more, you're in better con condition if you're fatter relative to your skeleton than if you are thinner. And this is the eye color. So higher up it is, the more colorful your eye patches. And you can see that eye color increases with higher body condition. So if you're in good condition, you also have a high, a nice colorful eye patch. But here, when we related urbanization to coloration, you can see that as urbanization increases, that eye patch becomes more and more faded. These are just tarsus and beak. They don't respond dynamically the way our eye patch does. So eye patch really provides us with a dynamic signal of, uh, of what's happening in terms of their nutrient intake. We also looked at external parasite loads. So this, this is the probability of having no parasite, external parasites, moderate loads, or high loads of external parasites, so mites in particular, related to urbanization. And you can see that as urbanization increases, your probability of having either moderate or high levels of parasites increases, and your probability of having no parasite, external parasites decrease. So another measure of you're not in that great body condition if you're in an urban area. So possibly because you're in high densities. Urban birds also have a high immune response, so you can do what's called a PHA test. You prick the bird with a PHA substance, chemical substance, and you look at the inflammation response. And this is a slightly controversial measure, but essentially when you can say that when urbanization increases here, you get a higher immune response. Now, whether that is indicative of a more healthy or a less healthy bird is what is controversial in in the literature, but we can certainly say they are getting a more, uh, a higher level immune response, which suggests they're exposed to more pathogens in their environment, which is again, doesn't sound like a great place to be if you're in an urban city. Then we did some stable isotopes on the feathers to try and get a grip on what they're eating since we have this interest in nutrients. And here are the, the N to C, the nitrogen to carbon ratios. And this is a, not, it's a measure of diet breadth, basically, of niche breadth. In the open circle here, you can see the breadth of um, the low urbanization birds. And then in the gray circle, you can see the high urbanization birds. And what you see is that in high urbanized areas, they essentially have a subset of the niche that the less urbanized birds have. And this suggests they're actually eating a more restricted range of foods in these urban areas than in the less urbanized areas. And this is just another way of representing this, that you can see the, the, the breadth of the niche is greater in the less urbanized areas. The other interpretation of these data are that they eat exactly the same foods in urban and suburban areas, but the isotope signature of those foods may differ in some way because the primary producers, the plants, have a different isotopic signature in each of those areas. That's another possible explanation. But we favor the one that the, the miners are actually eating different foods in these urban areas because it's consistent with the fact that we're finding the paler eye patch. It's also consistent with a lot of the literature that's now showing 
but miners in urbanized areas, um, they're showing a lot of morphological changes that are all, always related to foraging related traits. So changes in, in beak shape in particular are popping up in the urban areas. So it really suggests urban birds are eating different foods and it could be that this is what's driving this nutrient deprivation and the pale A patch, eye patch. So what we think is that, um, you know, back to this, these, again, this urban core, we think that what might be driving this range expansion is actually the declining conditions in the urban core. You know, you're a bird, difficult to get protein. You don't like carbohydrate. You have to fight for protein. And if you're a shy bird, then that might not be ideal. So you choose to, to move either to the suburban perimeter or to the front. And I'm going to show you one more data slide and then I'm wrapping up. That's it. I just want you, this is a complicated experiment. I'm not going to run you through it. But what we essentially did was we experimentally faded the eye patch of the birds by nutrient depriving them. Then we gave the birds a choice of nutrients and we looked at what nutrients they then chose to try and reestablish the color of their eye patches. And I just want you to look at the two gray points here. These are um, females, the triangles, and the males in the circle. And on the X here, we have protein. So as you go to the right, you increase your protein choice. And here we have lipids on the Y axis. Then we have carbohydrate on the diagonal here. This is nutritional geometry, Rabenhaber's uh, baby, if you want to, to look this up. But essentially, if you compare where these two points, females and males, sit on the protein axis, you can see the protein, the females are preferentially choosing protein when they're given the choice. And in fact, they don't reestablish their eye patch. The males choose foods that reestablish the color of their eye patch. The females choose protein. And we think that what's driving it is egg production. That they need protein to, to produce the eggs to reproduce. So this is my final slide. We think this is our working model. And it's fun to come up with these working models. We think that these females are responding to the declining conditions in urban areas. And they are essentially, uh, they don't like carbohydrates. They're in bad conditions. They can't reproduce. So they move to the front um, seeking, uh, seeking more protein intake, more invertebrates, more insects to be able to secure reproduction because they feed their nestlings insects and invertebrates, they need it for, for that. And um, yeah, that's it, I think. I'll just leave it there. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea. We've got uh, time for a few questions. Chris. <laughs> Uh, seems like you have a really neat system where you can test these predictions of the pace of life of the pecan. Do you know anything about the reproductive fitness differences between if you're suburb and private? Yeah, we, um, you know, that's sort of what we were hoping to find in our nest box work with our 250 nest boxes. Um, there aren't any differences as far as we can see in terms of reproductive success. So they, we were hoping we would have better reproductive success on the front. That would have been kind of consistent with the idea that they're moving to the front because it allows them to have more offspring. And we don't find it, but it's possible that, you know, the birds that are reproducing in those two environments have equal breeding success, right? It's just that there are a pile of birds in the area that aren't producing. So measuring the number of eggs, et cetera, and egg survival and chick survival, et cetera, isn't necessarily getting at it. So I guess the short answer is no, we haven't found any differences in reproductive success, but they're also very difficult to measure. And it's also not entirely clear that they, you know, they should be. Uh, what do you mean? Sorry? Oh, the energetic demands of reproduction. Yeah, it could be, or it's just that, you know, a subset of the birds are reproducing, right? So the same energetic demands, but it's a, but because some of the birds don't want to fight for access to the protein and, and territories, they have to fight for these territories, right? That's how the system works, they don't fight and so they move, but essentially 
you know, in, in all other respects, they're fairly similar. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yep. Oh, we didn't look at that. We just looked at mites. We just count mites. Yeah, and the external parasites. Um, yeah, so no, we don't know about female. Of course, that's the missing piece to the puzzle, right? I mean, the whole idea of using the eye patch is the eye patch is what females are using to, to select the males. And that's based on, I mean, the Blackbird literature, you know, it's pretty well established. We know also that these are carotenoids. We've done the microscopy work. We know the signal is carotenoid. It's a carotenoid signal, essentially. So it's highly likely the females are using it to choose males. And, you know, I guess possibly one of the drivers, so we haven't looked at, we have this relationship with urban cover. So when you say are the suburban birds less colorful, is that what? Yeah, so as urbanization increases, the birds, all of them, not males or females, they all become more colorful. And we think that's because they have a richer range of dietary foods. But I guess what could be happening in the urban core is that a lot of the males are getting pale eye patches and the females are not, not finding a suitable, a male that they think is suitable. And so, you know, they're moving in search of, you know, maybe more suitable males. I guess following on from that, so you, you found that the eye color patch got more colorful when it correlated well with the body condition. Yeah. Right? So that eye color patch would thus be an honest signal yeah. of effectively the free mass. Yeah. So it would be of foraging capacity, in fact, foraging, right? Yeah. yeah. Of a male to occupy a territory that has a good level of insects, which is what the females like. Have you looked at the condition of the gonads or anything in relation to the body condition? No, we haven't. <laughs> Oh, yes, just... we need a reproductive physiologist on board to chop them, <laughs> get them up. Yeah. Uh, as you, as you um, said in the introduction, there are really successful birds who are successful males as well. So your initial, my initial thought is maybe it just doesn't matter that they not be sufficient because their their, their chance of self defense is successful. So maybe is it that they don't have been in Australia for a couple of hundred years and you're showing a decline of maybe towards the more in a different country where they've been in. Um, that's true. Um, Australia is one of the older introduction areas, though. You know, the, the South African range is more recent. The Israeli um, range expansion is more recent. USA has only been... Um, invade in the last sort of 30 years. Europe is the same thing. So we're one of the oldest introduction points. But I fully agree with you that I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if the mechanisms of range expansion, so the drivers of range expansion, may differ across these different introduction locations across the globe. Because in South Africa, for example, they've shown that the females have longer wings on the range, on the range front. And so they're arguing that there's a spatial sorting model where females, you know, exactly the model I just said, you know, females are traveling further because they have longer wings and that's then leads to an accelerating range. They're saying that it's independent from urbanization. You know, I can't really comment because, because I don't work in their field sites, but what I can say in Australia is that the range expansion is following an urbanization gradient. They're moving from these densely populated um, 
highly urbanized coastal cities to the west where you have you know smaller townships they're, they are urban, but they're much smaller. They subside to agriculture environment much more quickly. And what we're seeing is the birds in, you know, the radio tracking experiment, for example, these exploratory home ranges are large because the birds are occasionally making these long distance journeys out to farm areas, possibly to find more invertebrates and insects that they find, for example, we know they find them in the race course, for example, at Newcastle, there's heaps of um, horse at the race course, there's heaps of Paris, ha horse dung, and there we find birds really colorful eye patches because presumably they had all the larvae and the horse dung. That might be what they're doing in these um, rural townships. And the urban birds can't do that because they are in large urban cities. So all they have is the urban, urban habitat. So that said, yeah, the, me the mechanism of range expansion might differ across different environments, different locations across the globe, simply because the landscapes differ. But I think it follows an urbanization gradient here. Yeah. Just one more question. So sorry, Louise, back there. Uh, so circling back to the beginning of your talk where you established that miners have a higher cognitive capability than a lot of yeah. birds. Um, and in their response, like the crafts and everything. Oh, yes, that, yes. Are you able to apply Um, I'm not entirely sure that I follow what you're thinking of, how that relates to them learning about traps. And maybe you can explain it to me afterwards because we're sort of running out of time. But, but what I can say is that I think that there are native species that are a barrier to common miners. Um, I think the noisy miners are very much a barrier to common miners. And one of the reasons why they don't move into suburban areas, as I was saying, you know, there's an urban core and they can either move to the suburban perimeter or they can move further. And I think one of the reasons why they don't go into the suburban areas is because the noisy miners are there like soldiers keeping them out. And so then their only choice is to move to a more rural township. So, yeah, I don't know about manipulating it. You know, the noisy miners are there. They're everywhere keeping them out. Ah, oh, the drone work. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess we could. Yeah, you could try and protect areas with the drone. We have to make sure it works well with pest birds first. <laughs> yeah, we could. All right. So we might um, wind it up there, but.